You are now watching Believe. Do you believe? We're back here on Sorallo Sports Talk, and joining the show up next, he is one of the best college basketball coaches in the country. In fact, he's the reigning SEC Coach of the Year, head coach of the Auburn Tigers, Bruce Pearl. Coach, thanks so much for joining the show. Great to be with you, man. Uh, I'm, I'm a listener, so excited about being with you. I really appreciate it, Coach. That's, that's great to hear. Hey, let's start with the obvious news, right? A couple weeks ago, you and the Auburn basketball program had a hell of a draft night. Of course, Jabari Smith going third overall. My question here is kind of twofold. First off, you know, I've been saying since college basketball, since the season was in full swing, that Jabari was the best player in the country. Obviously, his awards reflect that. So first off, how shocked were you that he actually slipped to the third overall pick? And then, of course, what are the Houston Rockets getting in this young man? Well, Joe, a couple things. Um, and again, it's great to be with you. Uh, Jabari has always been behind uh, Pablo and Chet, mm -hmm. like always. There was never any doubt about that in high school, like for years. Um, he probably came to Auburn somewhere between four and eight, top 10 for sure. But he really wasn't in that top two or three until the season began. People got to see him in the battle for Atlanta. They saw him against some really good teams. And up, 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 uh, this, this is different. Uh, he may be better than we thought. Yeah. Don't forget, we didn't beat Duke or North Carolina or Kentucky in the recruiting process. And then we beat Tennessee and LSU and Georgia. He didn't have that high, high, high major offer. So Jabari didn't really drop in the draft as much as he put himself in a position to possibly get drafted ahead of guys that were ahead of him for years. Mm -hmm. uh, it just didn't work out that way. Uh, but I know what you're saying, because prior to the draft, everybody thought Orlando was going to take him. Um, you know, when you got a guy in Jabari Smith who's made more threes than any 6'10 player in the history of college basketball, and he did it at 42% yeah. from behind the line, I mean – you know, he shot a great percentage and he had the volume um, and he was the best player on the floor. I had him every single night. That just doesn't happen, you know, very often. Uh, his ability to guard one through five, um, the way he affects winning with his defense um, and his attitude. And, you know, he's going to be he's the first pretty much in my mind NBA all star that I've had. He's an NBA. He's a future NBA all star. Yeah, absolutely, Coach. I, I couldn't agree more. When you look at Houston, and obviously, you know, they've gone through a total rebuild. They're still going through it. But now having him and Jalen Green together, how do you think those two are going to play off each other? Well, you know, I recruited Jalen to Auburn and almost got him, believe it or not. Uh, great kid, unbelievable hard worker. Uh, loved his mom and his sister and that family. Um, I, I mean, those are two of the best shooters in the game. Like you put those guys on, you talk about spreading the floor. Yeah. Um, you know, you got to guard those guys. Um, and so uh, there aren't many teams with, you know, you got, what do you got? You have two, two or three all-stars. You got a chance to be a great team. Are those, those are two, two future all-stars on the same roster. Uh, I think they'll complement each other very, very well. They both have got great length. Uh, you know, Jalen has got that freaky athletic ability. Just kind of, he's got, he's, he's got a little freak in him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jabari is just so skilled and, and has got such a, you know, incredible temperament. Um, and he's got real speed and quickness. He, he, he doesn't have the freaky up um, that, that Jalen does. Uh, but man, together, those are two of the best young players in, in the uh, NBA. Yeah. You know, coach, I really am not exaggerating when I say this, when I look at the season that Jabari just had and his size and his versatility, He's the smoothest one and done prospect I've seen since Kevin Durant. And that's no exaggeration. He really does remind me of KD, his one year at Texas. But, you know, he's not the only guy you had drafted in the first round a couple of weeks ago. Walker Kessler st started, of course, at North Carolina, found his way to Auburn. And the young man's already been traded twice. Now he's going to Utah, where the reigning Naismith Defensive Player of the Year is essentially replacing a three time NBA Defensive Player of the Year in Rudy Gobert. How do you think he's going to fit in in Utah playing that role? Well, I text Walker after the after he got traded, and I said, man, you know, last year you broke the NCAA record there for block shots in a single season, mm -hmm. and what do you do now? You've been in the NBA for six days, and you've already been on three teams. <laughs> That's got to be some kind of an NBA record, right? Yeah. Not exactly the record you're looking for. Um, 
you know, obviously, uh, you, you know, Rudy Bear, I don't know what size shoe he is, but those are big shoes to fill. Um, I think Walker's a really, really good upside prospect. Uh, he's a stretch five man, and um, he can shoot and will shoot that three ball. Um, he's got to shoot at a better percentage at the next level. I do absolutely believe he will. Uh, but then uh, he's the best player. He was the best player in college basketball in the air last year, in the air offensively, catching everything, uh, finishing everything, and then obviously changing shots. He is not seven foot. He's not seven one. He's seven one and a little bit. <laughs> and that little bit, I think, is one of the things, the difference between getting it and changing it and blocking it. He's got a pretty quick second jump, so he does a pretty good job of collecting his own, you know, miss, or his own block shot. And, um, yeah, I mean, he's going to – rim protection is very, very important um, in the league because everybody's playing, you know, four and five out. Mm -hmm. Everything is so spread. You've got to be able to get – you've got to be able to guys at the rim that can uh, that can and change all those downhill shots and, 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 and go rebound the backside. So I think Walker is going to be, you know, going to be really, really good. Uh, in those areas and he can and he also can move his feet he's got the ability to guard one through five just like Jabari does and that's obviously what plays at, the, at that level yeah no shortage of versatility with those two now you know, coach we are going to get to other topics I want to get to the upcoming season of course I want to get to conference realignment there's one more player I need to ask you about though and he's been on the show he was on about a year ago from your Auburn team from a year ago it's your old point guard Sharif Cooper now, you know, Sharif got limited run with the Hawks, was mainly in the G League this year. And it's a tough team to really, as a guard, work your way into with Trey Young, now DeJounte Murray. But I thought, even though he played limited games at Auburn, I thought everything I saw out of him was beyond impressive. He averaged, I believe, about eight assists per game in his limited time with you that season. So what does Sharif need to be successful at the next level? Because I, I personally do view him as someone who can be an NBA point guard. Oh, just needs the opportunity. And that's, mm -hmm. that's all he needs. I mean, Atlanta really didn't have the opportunity for him because obviously, you know, Trey Young is there and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and in some ways is similar. Um, you know, Sharif may not be the shooter scorer, but as far as a playmaking point guard, I, there, there's not a, I don't have, I have five, well, I see have four fingers and a thumb. There aren't four better playmaking guards that are just pure playmakers. Sharif's ability to get in the lane and make plays for himself and others. It's just really, really rare. Mm -hmm. And um, I think he's going to go to Vegas. And if Atlanta gives him the opportunity to really go play, he's going to be a real value. Uh, he maybe doesn't stick with the Hawks because of the opportunity they don't have with the, uh, uh, on their NBA roster. But let me tell you something, you know, when, when, when dogs are out there and they're all kind of sniffing around or whatever, you know, the big dog is in the, in the, Shreve Cooper's the big dog. And when he's on the floor, those other nine dogs out there, they know it. They know it. And coaches may not know it. The fans may not know it. Those other nine dogs, they know it. And I hope he gets that opportunity out there uh, in, in Vegas. Um, he's gotten bigger and he's gotten stronger. He can defend. That's the one aspect of his game that he needs to just show it more. Just going to need to show the fact that he can make plays defensively also. Because when you are small, you know, you got to be able to be pesky. He can be, he just needs to do it more often. But as far as what he can do over 94 feet, you know, coast to coast, getting in the rim, scoring through contact, making plays for everybody else, he is rare, unique, and, and worth the price of admission. Yeah, I love it. I hope he gets that opportunity, Coach. If you're just joining us here on Serralo Sports Talk, reigning SEC Coach of the Year, head coach of the Auburn men's basketball program, Bruce Pearl joining the show. Coach, we've got to talk conference realignment. Now, the SEC so far hasn't seen anything as crazy geography-wise as what the Big Ten did last week, adding USC and UCLA to a conference that hosts, you know, Rutgers, Maryland, Penn State. We're talking conference rivals some 2,500 miles apart. With college sports inevitably heading towards super conferences, more specifically the Big Ten and the SEC being the two top dogs there, how do you feel as a basketball coach? Because to me, this is a move that, you know, is predominantly being made for money. And with that said, for football. So as a basketball coach, how would you feel if you're coaching in Piscataway, New Jersey, and you've got to make conference trips to play UCLA, USC every year? What, what do you think? What kind of impact will this have on the other sports such as hoops? And then, you know, the sports that make essentially no or way less money like baseball, soccer, and so on and so forth. 
Yeah, I, I think in football and basketball, it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think in those other sports, it, it is a, a major issue. You know, go, going from the West Coast to, you know, Happy Valley or to, uh, you know, to Rutgers and, you know, different places like that. You know, how's, how does it, you know, those teams, like you just said, soccer and, you know, baseball and, you know, other sports, volleyball, how those guys obviously travel. Look, the Big Ten, when the Big Ten went, Penn State, Rutgers, Maryland, uh, but really Rutgers, Maryland more than the others, they went for eyeballs. They went for the television markets. Uh, it was Those were financial decisions. And then obviously L.A. Was a, was a tremendous financial decision. They've locked up many of the biggest television markets in the country, uh, with the exception of in the southeast uh, or, or in Texas. Um, and that's going to mean more revenue. And that's what that's obviously what is what is driving this. I think Commissioner Sankey uh, in the SEC, uh, the Southeastern Conference, if you look at our fit point, every one of our states, we're all sort of connected. So Greg Sank Sankey kind of coming out of the uh, collegiate mold uh, and uh, uh, rather than just the business mold, um, sort of done it like I think you would expect it to be done. I'm not criticizing what the Big Ten's done. I think for their own conference, it's uh, a, a very aggressive, but a rule that a rule, you know, something that makes makes obviously, you know, some financial sense. This isn't over, you know. Obviously, this is just the beginning. Um, you know, an LA less Pac-12. Wow. I mean, I was at Stanford. You know, mm -hmm. I know what LA was the recruiting hub of, and and the, and the, not just LA, but the greater Southern California region. Yeah. The Pac-12 doesn't have a team in Southern California right now. I, I mean, I, I don't know what the number is, but I bet you, I want to say 60% of the student athletes that are in the Pac-12, that's a guess, mm -hmm. come from California, maybe half of them from Southern California. Anyways, that, that's just a wild guess. I think that obviously, well, that's a gut punch. I don't think obviously the Pac-12 uh, – is going to be able to survive without some major other realignments happening. And then, you know, do, do the Washingtons and the Oregons stay as connected with the, with the Arizonas? Who knows? Doesn't seem like it's going to happen. I mean, right now, and, and they're just reports and rumors, but it looks like Oregon might be headed to the big 10 following suit and Arizona, Arizona state might be going to the new big 12. I, I mean, you know, I don't know for me, coach, uh, even though I'm young, I'm a bit of a traditionalist. And I think that, you know, geography breeds some of the best rivalries in college sports. Obviously, look at you guys in Alabama. I mean, obviously for football, it's even bigger. But in hoops, it's a tremendous rivalry as well, especially with both programs in recent years being very successful. And now it just feels like you're losing that. I'm not a fan. How do you feel about the fact that, you know, the SEC is inevitably going to have 2024 teams in the near future? Well, I'm with you, Joe, and I appreciate you being young and being a traditionalist. I'm old and I'm a traditionalist, so I hear you. Um, but I wasn't in favor of when they changed the rules that really kind of eliminated trapping in the game of college basketball uh, mm -hmm. because of that whole, you know, my space, your space cone thing. I mean, we used to love to get involved in trapping and speeding the game up, and now you can't. It's really hard to do it legally. And I wasn't in favor of that, but you just got to adjust. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have to make the adjustments. NIL. Is going to have to be an adjustment. Transfer portal is going to be an adjustment. Conference alignment's got to be an adjustment. The the system of intercollegiate athletics in our country is still wonderful and amazing, and has done as much to affect our our society as anything. Think about the scholarships. Think about the racial barriers. Uh, think about the gender barriers that have been absolutely broken down, mm -hmm. thanks to Title IX. Uh, you know, poor kids from the inner city, poor kids from the rural America. Are now we're now able to go to college uh, on an athletic scholarship that didn't happen 60 years ago, um, and so look what we're doing really works. It's part of our society. You know, Saturday afternoons of college football that's just not going to go anywhere. I, I think the rivalries will change, um, but we we will survive. We just got to adjust. Well, coach, before I let you go, and I appreciate the time so much. You know, obviously last season, it didn't end the way that I'm sure many of us had anticipated or many of us had hoped. I will admit I had you guys in my final four last year. Uh, my but apologies. Looking, <laughs> no worries at all. But looking ahead to next season, there's a lot to be excited about. You've got a really good recruiting class coming in, top 15, top 20, anywhere you look. So tell us a little bit about what to expect from the 2022 Auburn Tigers. Well, Joe, you lose the best front line in college basketball. Mm -hmm. uh, you, let's just start there. 
um, we brought in Yoan Trailer and John I Broom. Um, they were two of the better young inside prospects that were available in the spring. And we got we got two of what may have been the top two or three guys that were absolutely on the board. And that was simply required. It was required because we lost, you know, Jabari and Walker. Um, they both have got great upside. They're both great kids. They both got terrific talent. I think they're both going to be going to be pros. Um, uh, Yoan, they're both and they're both inside out players. They both can guard multiple positions. Mm-hmm. Uh, both really good workers. So I think our front line white, where where I can't anticipate it being as good, is still going to be very good. The question is in the backcourt, will we get better? Uh, will the returning players, Wendell Green and Katie Johnson and Alan Flanagan and you know Chris Moore and you know Leo Berman and Zepp Jasper, will those guys get better? from a year ago and how much better. Um, and then we brought in uh, Trey Donaldson, a real solid point guard in Chance Westry, who's a combo guard that can play lots of positions that has got a lot of talent. And so uh, I think we're going to be competitive. But look, last year we were picked fifth in the league. We won it. But we were still picked fifth. Why? Because the teams picked in front of us were Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, and Arkansas. I think all four of those teams will be picked in front of us this year as well. And there could be somebody else that slips in there. Um, but I think we're going to be picked anywhere between five, four, five, six, right in there. We might would be my guest. And I think this roster is capable of doing that. Um, and uh, you know, we're we're gonna have to we're we're in the middle right now of reinventing it. I love their work ethic. We're going to Israel this summer. Uh, and so we're preparing for that foreign trip. We'll be the first power five men's college basketball team to ever travel to Israel and play. Um, oh, wow. very, very excited. We're playing the Israeli national team, uh, and we're playing the, uh, an out, you know, some really, really good teams over there. Um, and hopefully this is the beginning of a, every August event in Israel, attracting some of the best teams in college basketball, but also letting our student athletes experience their Judeo Christian and Muslim, uh, uh, origins as far as the birthplace of all the religions. So we're very, very excited about taking the team there. It sounds amazing, Coach. Best of luck with that trip. It sounds like an incredible experience. And I will say, before I do let you go, that as a St. Bonaventure Bonnie alum, preseason rankings mean absolutely nothing. We're picked for nothing every year. So, you know, if you guys are picked fourth, fifth, sixth, go win it again, Coach. We're going to try. And and you got a great coach in Mark Schmidt. Uh, By the way, Mark was a freshman when I was a senior at Boston College. So I know him very, very well. One of the best offensive minds anywhere in basketball. Absolutely. Absolutely. Coach Bruce Pearl, thank you so much for the time. We'll be back here on Sorallo Sports Talk with my final word. Thank you for watching Believe. You can find more great content at Believe.com. That's B-L-E-A-V.com. Do you believe?